Okay, um, Assalamualaikum and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to episode 39 of our breakfast at uh, UM Health. So um, let me get started by introducing our, our next our speaker for today. So our speaker is Dr. Bhavani Arubugam. She is a senior lecturer from uh, the Department of Biomedical Science, Faculty of Medicine. So today she'll be talking about emerging strategies in insulin delivery for the treatment of diabetes mellitus. So just a quick reminder for everyone who has joined us. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please type them in the Q&A chat and uh, we will try our best to go through all of them at the end of the talk. So uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Bhavani to start her talk. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Anwar. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Great. Okay, thank you very much for moderating the session and uh, thank you to the organizer for giving me this opportunity again. Um, and also thanks to all present today to listen to my presentation, which is entitled uh, Emerging Strategies uh, for the Delivery of Insulin for the Treatment of Diabetes Mellitus. Okay, great. So um, following will be the outline for my presentation today. So I'll start off with uh, some brief introduction on uh, the use of insulin for the treatment of uh, diabetes and followed by uh, the strategies that have been used to overcome limitations and to improve delivery of insulin in various routes to, uh, for the administration of insulin, such as the subcutaneous and other alternate routes. And as a final touch, I'll go through uh, the techniques, uh, site-directed mutagenesis and uh, chemical modification that we have actually explored in our laboratory to modify uh, insulin. So one of the primary uh, goal in uh, diabetes treatment is to maintain glucose levels in normal range. And uh, insulin plays an important role in achieving this. Insulin is a peptide hormone uh, that regulates uh, glucose, a uh, blood glucose level. And it achieves this by um, actually uh, activating the insulin signaling pathway. The insulin actually binds to its specific receptor or known as the insulin receptor and that activates a downstream uh, signaling pathway which is known as insulin signaling pathway that translocates glucose transporter 4 to the membrane and from here the extracellular glucose will be taken into the cells such as fat, muscles and liver and will be stopped and, and hence this actually allows uh, the regulation of the uh, extracellular or the blood glucose level. So the definition of diabetes mellitus is a uh, body's uh, inability to produce any or enough insulin or to use the insulin that is produced effectively. So this causes uh, an elevated glucose level or known as the uh, hyperglycemia and also glucose intolerance. So diabetes mellitus can be classified into uh, the following classes, the type 1, type 2, gestational diabetes, uh, which is seen in pregnant women and other specific uh, type of diabetes, which is which is caused by very specific factors, either by a drug or uh, some diseases or genetic mutation. So of these, the major types uh, are actually type 1 and type 2. And of course, the type 2 diabetes mellitus is the uh, more predominant type due to the uh, contribution of about 90 to 95% of cases. So type 1 diabetes mellitus is treated using uh, insulin as the sole therapy mainly due to the lack of insulin production caused by the autoimmune damage and uh, impact insulin production. As for type 2 diabetes mellitus, uh, it occurs due to a condition known as insulin resistance in which the cells become insensitive to insulin's effect and hence insulin could not perform its biological effect or either the uh, impact insulin secretion. And hence, um, the management of type 2 diabetes mellitus actually involves uh, the use of oral medication such as metformin, sulfonylureas, and many others, uh, and or, or in combination with uh, insulin as well. Since uh, insulin is highly susceptible to enzymatic breakdown in gastrointestinal tract, for example, enzymes, the proteolytic enzymes, uh, such as peps, uh, pepsin, chy uh, uh, chymotrypsin, and et cetera, in our gastrointestinal tract, this makes that uh, the delivery of insulin through oral route is not possible. And that is why uh, insulin has been administered uh, widely using the subcutaneous method. However, the method has uh, limitations, uh, several limitations, such as uh, reduced patient compliance. This is the major one because the use of needles actually um, creates the fear due to the pain, the swelling, or sometimes in some cases, infection in patients. And uh, upon uh, administrating uh, insulin exogenously, 
the amount that actually reaches after passing through the peripheral circulation is only uh, in a very small amount, which is about 20% to the liver. And therefore, the uh, effect that can be exhibited or exerted by uh, the insulin will be uh, less efficient because of this. And variability in insulin absorption at the injection site uh, makes it difficult for the estimation of the dose or the effectiveness of uh, insulin in different individuals. Besides that, uh, the sum suffers with adverse effects, uh, for example, the lipodystrophy, or hypoglycemia, and many others. On top of all these limitations due to the administration method, insulin on its own has uh, a major uh, problem, which is the instability. Um, insulin on its own originally is a uh, stable in its hexameric form, it actually uh, dissociates into monomeric form to perform its biological effect once it enters blood. So the association and dissociation uh, of as insulin is actually um, influenced by many factors such as temperature, thermal, uh, thermal pH, ionic strength and uh, additives such as zinc. So due to this, um, it, it is very labile or fragile towards uh, external factors. For example, this can be easy, easily uh, affected by agitation or heat uh, produced during transportation. So what happens is uh, the hexameric form will dissociate into dimer or monomeric form, and then it tends to self-aggregate and form fibrils. So this diminishes the potency and bioavailability of insulin. However, there have been strategies to actually uh, correct this. For example, by the addition of sialic acid, uh, which in, gives uh, <clears throat> stability of insulin against thermal and uh, mechanical stress. Cellulase-based uh, supramolecular hydrogel actually protects insulin against harsh uh, thermal condition. So um, due to all these limitations, uh, all these limitations basically has actually prompted the development of research on uh, to look at how insulin can be in administered through alternate routes and this includes nasal, oral, transdermal, buccal, and pulmonary. So the products or the, uh, that have been developed or formulated uh, will be uh, designed as such that it will fit to be delivered under the different routes, as well as to address the limitations that have been observed with the subcutaneous administration. However, the respective routes itself have their own challenges to overcome, and the primary goal uh, by overcoming the challenges is to uh, ensure that the uh, insulin that has been formulated is stable, bioavailable, and uh, efficient at the end of the day. So let's look at these uh, different routes. Okay. So of course, uh, as I said, the different routes are catered to actually uh, overcome limitations that's faced by subcutaneous methods. So as such, oral route is the most prefer uh, preferred route because it's non-invasive, painless. It avoids skin infection avoids a peripheral hyperinsulinemia that is observed with the subcutaneous method. However, um, delivery of drugs, or in this case insulin, through oral route has its own limitations. The major ones are physical barrier, in which insulin being a large protein molecule, as well as being hydrophilic uh, by its nature, so it will have uh, issues in crossing intestinal epithelial cells. It's not easy to diffuse across to be absorbed. And uh, the mucose layer is actually uh, provides a lubricant, lubricating layer to protect the epithelial cell, but it itself actually becomes a barrier for the uh, absorption of uh, insulin. And of course, uh, the digestion of insulin by proteolytic enzymes and harsh pH conditions are expected. And the first pass effect. So any drugs they have to actually, after um, absorbed through the uh, Intestine, it has to pass through the liver before it reaches to its target site. So by the time it actually reaches to its target site, it will be only available in a lower amount. So that is one of the major limitations under oral group. So some of the strategies that have been uh, introduced or have been uh, used in past and in present are as stated uh, as listed here. So the uh, classic uh, example is conjugation to polysaccharide, or uh, one of the examples is phytosin. Phytosin actually improves chemical stability, um, protects against gastric digestion, and allows sustained release of insulin. Other specific formulation includes uh, pH-sensitive semi-IPN hydrogels, which provides protection against harsh pH and thermal conditions. A formulation with protease inhibitors that uh, protects against uh, proteolytic digestion. Permission and absorption enhances 
facilitates uh, the absorption of uh, insulin across the physical barrier. And uh, there's another method in which uh, the insulin can be encapsulated within a carrier and that carrier will actually uh, protect the uh, insulin against thermal, chemical uh, stress, as well as from proteolytic digestion. And uh, upon reaching the target site, it actually uh, releases the insulin effectively to make um, insulin to be available, bioavailable, and to perform its uh, biological activity efficiently. So one uh, example of self-assembling bubble carriers includes choline and geranate, or known as CAGE. Uh, it actually improves insulin uh, absorption and uh, lowers blood glucose level. So examples of nanocarriers include liposomes and nanoparticles. So following are some of the products that have been uh, produced uh, using some of the strategies stated here. So uh, there are many others, uh, okay, uh, which we have actually recently uh, submitted a manuscript, a review on this, and it has been accepted and it's a gate of print. Uh, once it's available online or in press, uh, please feel free to go through to uh, get more information on this. So these products have been tested in a preclinical um, evaluation, either using in vitro or animal models. And it, uh, the products either have shown improved thermal stability or chemical stability and reduced blood glucose level or HbA1c in animal model. And some of the novel uh, formulations have successfully made into uh, clinical trials. So these are the uh, information of the reason formulations that are currently in uh, actively studied in clinical trials. So Tregopil is a pigilated uh, human insulin formulated into tablet. A product by Oramat is uh, actually a formulation uh, in an enteric coated oral capsule containing a carrier, protease inhibitor and absorption enhancer. Allegen uh, actually contains permission enhancer and oral HTV insulin contains uh, lipid bio nanoparticle. So all these products uh, actually have shown uh, reduction in either glucose level or HbA1c uh, level in patients during the clinical trial. So let's move on to pulmonary road. So the advantages here is it avoids the first, first pass effect that's observed with, uh, under oral road. Okay? It has large absorption surface area to uh, uh, enhance the delivery of insulin, absorption of insulin to systemic circulation. And then it has good epithelial permeability. In fact, this is one unique criteria that pulmonary root has because uh, this is the only root that doesn't require a permeation enhancer compared to the other roots. It also allows rapid absorption of inhaled molecules. However, the major limitations uh, includes uh, the physical characteristics of the insulin, the formulated insulin itself, because um, the, the characteristics should be as such that the particle should be able to be deposited and absorbed well in the lung cells. Um, so the size, shape, and the formulation itself has to be um, designed well so that it can be deposited well. But upon deposition, uh, the particles will then encounter another obstacle, which is the transport obstacle that is conferred by the pulmonary surfactant and uh, alveolar macrophages that actually stands as a protective layer in lungs to remove uh, sequester and remove uh, foreign particles. So to overcome this, the strategies uh, are focused on uh, formulating insulin with excipients, especially in a dry inhaled powder form. So one example is hyaluronic uh, acid hydrogels. So the formulation of insulin with this hyalur uh, hyalur uh, hyaluronic acid hydrogels actually allows a better aerolization, provides a longer term uh, long-term stability as well as thermal stability. Besides, the strategies also focuses on uh, inventing a good inhalation device for the uh, efficient delivery of the insulin. So some, these are some of the examples that have been tested using preclinical uh, setup, and there are many others. So some of it that have uh, made into clinical trials and active currently are uh, Afraza, the well-known Afraza, which is currently in market and uh, mainly used in USA. Uh, and also a product from Aramie Therapeutics. Okay. Um, so Afriza is actually, it, uh, it's, it's available in different doses. The, the cartridges are um, it's available in four, eight, and 12 unit cartridges. And um, the, the principle here is uh, when a patient actually inhales the powder using the uh, inhaler device, 
uh, the powder will be aerolyzed and then uh, the insulin will be delivered to the lungs. And this actually depends on individual um, because of the inhalation method and the technique. And uh, upon reaching to the lungs, the insulin will be dissociated from its carrier molecule and it will be absorbed into systemic circulation while the carrier molecule will be excreted in kidney. So uh, the different products have shown a good uh, glycemic control uh, when tested using uh, clinical trials. Uh, next is the transdermal route. Uh, it is easy. Uh, it's, it's known for its, uh, the ease of uh, application. It's non-invasive, uh, inexpensive, inexpensive. It avoids the first pass effect. It has a large area for delivery, drug delivery. The major limitation is uh, the diffusion barrier uh, due to the low skin permeability. So insulin being a large molecule, uh, so it is understandable that it is not easy to uh, push through the insulin over the skin layer to the systemic circulation. So to overcome this, there are two approaches, passive and active approaches. Passive approaches here means, uh, so the use of formation enhances ionic increase of transdermal patches, allows in a drug, or in this case insulin, to enter the skin layer uh, naturally without any external support or force. So um, formation, uh, an example of ionic liquids are cage. Okay, it has been shown to try, uh, deliver um, proteins without affecting biological activity. As for permission enhancers, uh, fatty acids, uh, alcohols, or nanomicroemulsions can be used. Transdermal patches um, actually works well for lipophilic drug, but uh, since insulin is hydrophilic molecule, it's a hydrophilic molecule, it requires an external support or force to um, force it to enter through the uh, skin layer. So therefore, transdermal patches usually will be used in combination with active approaches such as micro needles and ionophoresis and many others. So micro needles, although we say it's needles, it is not as the normal uh, scenario we observe in subcutaneous method. Micro needles here actually causes uh, minimal discomfort and it is available in different forms and designs. Ionophoresis actually applies a low voltage of electric field uh, to allow the molecule to pass through the skin layer. So at the same time, we can control, when we control the electric field, we can control the dosage as well. So these are some of the products, okay? And which has shown increased uh, thermal stability, uh, for example, the dissolving polymer microneedles. And all these have actually shown improved uh, glycemic control as well uh, when tested using in vivo models. So some of the products uh, that have made to clinical trials, and in fact have received FDA approval is microinject. Okay, and uh, we go wearable insulin delivery. In fact, it is currently available in market. Okay, it's like a credit card size of a patch. Okay, which is just a wearable transformer patch. And it has shown improved glycemic control, reduced HbA1c, and um, has been actually reported to say that it could actually save the cost of therapeutics for patients. And a uh, use-free transformer delivery system actually uses an ultrasound-mediated microporation. Uh, of the stratum corneum. In fact, one of the primary barrier in uh, the transdermal route is actually contributed by the stratum corneum layer. Okay, next is uh, nasal route. It is non-invasive, painless. Okay, it has large surface area for absorption, avoids uh, first pass effect. Uh, it works well for lipophilic drug again, but uh, hence it has poor absorption for polar molecules. And besides that, uh, the defensive layer or the mechanism, which is called the mucociliary uh, mechanism, MCC system, actually works to, um, it actually causes rapid drug clearance. So this itself a uh, barrier for drug delivery. So in this case, it's insulin. So the strategies that have been uh, recently used is to formulate insulin with absorption enhancers, such as uh, bile salts, fatty acids, phytosin, and surfactants. So these are some of the examples. And... Um, so far till uh, at this point, there's no uh, products that are currently have received FDA approval under national route. So moving to buccal route, okay, this should not be confused with oral route. Buccal means it's basically the cheek lining. Okay, so uh, the application of drugs around this area actually uh, is known to be non-invasive, painless, avoids first pass effect. The limitation is uh, due to the relatively small area. Um, we can expect a low absorption of the drug that's being delivered. 
And there are some digestive enzymes in this area. Uh, unlike uh, the gastrointestinal tract, the digestive enzymes here are aminopeptidases, esterases. So, um, so it can actually affect the uh, viability of the enzyme and the stability of the enzyme. Besides, uh, one of the major uh, problem uh, that complicates the matter is the presence of saliva and the movement of mouth and the swallowing uh, effect. So the saliva actually makes um, the absorption of insulin to be difficult and also the estimation, it complicates the estimation of the dose for the patient. So to overcome this, uh, the recent strategies includes uh, formulation again with absorption enhancers, excipients for device assisted delivery, and incorporation into polymeric mucoadhesive uh, and uh, nanoparticles okay, to encapsulate and pro um, uh, provide the stability towards the uh, insulin molecule. So these are some of the products and there are many others. And again, uh, there are no products at the moment that have received FDA approval or currently in clinical trial under the buckle group. So uh, just a quick summary on what we have gone through. Generally, the strategies that have been used to improve stability and bioavailability of insulin under the different routes uh, includes conjugation to different moieties, formulation with nanocarrier technology, and formulation with excipients and permeation enhancers. Um, Next, I will move to site-directed mutagenesis. It's a technique that can be used to increase stability of protein. And this attracted our attention because uh, particularly uh, the surface lysing to arginine mutagenesis has been uh, widely used in uh, protein stability engineering. So these are the molecular formula of arginine and lysine. Both are positively charged amino acids or known as basic amino acids. Um, lysine has, uh, they differ by by the uh, side chain uh, groups. Lysine has an amine group, whereas arginine has a polydino group. Um, so this is how they are denoted in their abbreviation forms. So arginine generally has a higher PKA than lysine, and this actually uh, gives it the features to be more stable compared to lysine. Um, and of course, the stability also contributed by its geometric uh, structure as well as uh, it is able to form better ionic interactions compared to lysine. So the amino acids are commonly found at the surface of the protein, as can be uh, seen here. So R actually uh, indicates arginine. So they are actually available at the outer surface of the protein. So they are available for interactions. Okay. So what we have attempted is a molecular modeling study on investigating uh, the effect of the point mutation of arginine the single arginine 22 in lysine to lyse, uh, arginine to lysine, and the single lysine K29, which is lysine 29 to arginine. So uh, we have checked what is the stability of the protein upon subjecting the protein to the respective uh, mutations. So this is the uh, Walta or the na native form. So upon uh, mutating arginine 22 to lysine, it has actually shown an uh, overall destabilizing effect. And this can be understandable due to the negative delta delta G value. Whereas the lysine, uh, mutation of lysine 29 to arginine has, an, uh, has shown an uh, overall stabilizing effect. And this is understandable as I've explained earlier that arginine uh, naturally has these uh, characteristics to uh, exert more stable properties compared to lysine, right? Having this in mind, the ability uh, of the conversion of lysine to arginine, the, the ability for it to stabilize the protein, we have attempted um, a chemical modification known as coordination, which actually carries a similar property in which lysine upon addition of a reagent called O-metal isourea converts lysine to homoarginine. Okay, normally, coordination is used to study the essential nature of lysine residues, means the role of lysine residues in terms of stability, biological activity, or interaction with receptors in proteins. So, although uh, lysine, even after conversion to homoarginine, it still maintains positive charge. It does not uh, affect the system a lot. Okay? It maintains the electro, uh, electrostatic free energy. Uh, in fact, it enhances the conformation. Again, it has been shown to enhance conformation of the stability of protein in pumps. And uh, what is more interesting that it is actually, co it causes the protein to attain more compact structure. As arginine uh, actually introduces more, a little more hydrophobicity and causes the protein to attain, uh, attain more 
uh, complex structure, and this is favorable in the permeability of protein. So uh, insulin, as mentioned earlier, has a single lysine residue, and uh, interestingly, it is actually located near the binding region that binds to the insulin receptor or the insulin tyrosine kinase receptor. So again, using molecular modeling study, we have studied the different versions of the lysine. One is the native form. Okay, one is in the protonated state at pH seven, and uh, the guanidinated lysine. Okay, so what we have observed is so this is the guanidinated protein at uh, lysine twenty nine. It has actually attained a more compact structure compared to the native protein, whereas the protonated state has a more expanded structure. So we were keen to know what is the interaction energy. So interestingly, we actually found that. Uh, the molecular modeling study revealed that uh, the quantitative protein showed a stronger binding compared to a protonated state, as shown uh, from the more negative uh, interaction energy value. So, as a summary, okay, uh, the mutation point mutation of lysine to arginine exhibited overall stabilizing effect, and the guanidination actually enhanced a uh, stronger binding of the protein receptor of the protein to its receptor. So all this actually reflects that basicity at lysine residue plays an important role in enhancing the binding of the protein and affecting uh, the stability of the protein. So all this has been established using molecular modeling study. So we have attempted to actually mimic this uh, on bench. So we have performed a cell culture study in which uh, the insulin has been coordinated uh, and it has been treated on edible sites. And uh, we noticed that uh, it, uh, the quantitative protein should enhance glucose uptake and adipogenesis. Adipogenesis means um, lipid accumulation into the cells compared to the native insulin. So this suggests that uh, the conversion of lysine to arginine certainly has shown some uh, improvement in protein stability and facilitated efficient biological activity of insulin. And this is understandable due to these reasons, as I've explained earlier. So all these have actually given us an idea that uh, the insulin can be potentially modified using the techniques that uh, is either site direct mutagenesis or chemical modification and uh, can be applied in the different routes with or without the presence of excipients or enhancers and uh, which needs further validation and evaluation in future studies. And uh, we believe it will be useful for the treatment of diabetes. So with this, I would like to actually acknowledge uh, the funding that uh, financial support received from Ministry of Education Malaysia and University of Malaya in the form of FRGS, UMRG and uh, Faculty Research Grant. And these are some of the uh, references used. Sorry. Um, okay. So this is my profile. So uh, feel free to email me for further inquiries. And this is my UM expert uh, page ID. So these are some of my collaborators in UM and external institutions. I hope to receive, um, I would like to welcome collaboration from after this talk. Okay, with that, thank you very much for your attention. I'm glad to share uh, some findings from my research area. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Bhavani, for insightful talk. So um, let's go straight to the questions. There's actually a few questions up already. So um, I think let's start with the first one by uh, Dr. Gan Chi Xia. What's the difference between pulmonary and buccal root for insulin? Is that both using the inhaler? I think pulmonary root is uh, is inhaler, but buccal root is more like an applicator that actually requires some uh, adjustment in, in order to be inserted through the skin, the lining area of buccal root. So uh, inhaler is as far as uh, uh, we know that it, it makes use of the inhaler device that's designed specifically for the aerolization of the powder. All right. Um um, second question is from Dr. Chan Yu Kuen. Would this form of administration of insulin impact patients more in the developing world? I noticed that your research in this field seems to be Asian, suggesting a huge need to meet needs in the developing world. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I understand because, in fact, uh, the uh, the different alternate rules are highly actually uh, being investigated. In fact. Uh, those in market are currently used in uh, like US and it's actually yet to reach here in uh, I mean uh, countries in developing uh, uh, world. So, uh, but one of it, one of the invest invention that actually made through in Malaysia currently is uh, if you have heard about GLP-1, it has been actually used uh, in injection mode as well to be applied to insulin patients. Uh, 
as an alternate to insulin. That's another uh, drug that has been used to treat diabetes. However, the oral form of the um, GLP-1 is currently have been approved by Malaysian government. It's, uh, it, 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 it is actually available for usage, but of course, I'm unsure whether it has actually entered to the uh, hospitals to be you know, um, distributed among patients. So that's for the oral um, delivery. But uh, the other routes, which are still under clinical trials, and uh, definitely uh, for the research to be conducted here, it needs a huge amount of effort and support because in terms of the technology and uh, the number, the recruitment of patients. So, but this is possible in future, hopefully. Um, and uh, I hope that government is actually looking into um, pulling over some of the innovations back to Malaysia or some de other developing countries. Okay, okay. thank you. And I think uh, one final question before we, we end is from uh, Dr. Kamala Kanan. Uh, Tangavelu is among all these new availability of insulin, what route is superior? Is it the pulmonary route? Okay, from our observation on our review, uh, what has been recommended, okay, uh, although it is not uh, fully um, declared, but uh, apparently pulmonary route appears to be a better uh, way of apply, uh, administrating insulin, basically because the large absorption uh, characteristics and then it uh, doesn't require extensive uh, addition of chemicals such as permeation enhancers to allow its uh, um, permeability of insulin. Besides, uh, uh, it is known that the absorption through lungs is much greater compared to the other routes because uh, drugs, even if it's not insulin, even the other, other forms of drugs are, um, have been reported to be easily uh, absorbed into systemic circulation through pulmonary route compared to other routes. But of course, uh, this has this is still being investigated in many um, research studies. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Vaini. Um, hopefully, if, I think there's the fi final question, I think, which is uh, a follow-up to that, um, if, if we have just a bit of time, is um, Dr. Kamala has said that oral, the oral route of semaglutide and the GLP receptor agonist is available. What are your views on this? Of course, it, it is definitely a new breakthrough. And uh, of course, this is what we are working towards, right? This is what the main uh, limitations of subcutaneous method. And uh, I believe uh, this is what patients and the uh, clinical uh, community is expecting to introduce insulin in a different form. In fact, oral method is the preferred method. So for me, I feel that it will, hopefully it will receive a good uh, recognition and uh, I believe it has gone through multiple clinical trials and currently uh, it is still in the phase for clinical trial testing. So um, it will be evaluated further. So that request uh, requires the support. Uh, and then of course, from the medical community to encourage patients and to let them know that this is available. And it's going to ease patients a lot because rather than uh, going through the heart uh, method of uh, injections every day. So oral would be definitely a favorable method for them. But of course, uh, I'm sure they will still monitor the effectiveness and the safety over the time period. So for me, I, I, I truly encourage and I, I really support uh, the uh, introduction of the oral form of this medication. Okay, uh, Dr. Bhavani, thank you so much for uh, your insightful talk and also I think you've also helped um, answer some of the questions that have been brought up. So um, again, thank you everyone to uh, for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, so if you need to um, get your e-certificate for your CPD points, uh, please look into the chat. There is a form that you should fill in and then you can actually uh, get the, the e-cert from there. So please click on the, 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 the link at the chat there if you need your e-cert. Uh, okay, thank you everyone um, and hope to see you again soon at the next uh, UM Breakfast. All right, guys, say bye. Thank you very much.